Okay, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for joining today's TBS Science Colloquium. I suggest we begin, but um, I'm sure some people will join us a bit later. Um, as always, I would like to start by giving a short introduction of our speaker, speaker today, and then after his talk, we'll have time for questions, of course. Um, I would also like to point out that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to the TBS YouTube channel later. Uh, so today our speaker is Dax Felis. He is an exoplanetary researcher from New York City and now a PhD candidate in the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge program. Uh, in his research, he primarily focuses on looking for transiting exoplanets around M dwarf stars using photometry from the NASA TESS mission. He is also involved in developing techniques for the detection of stellar flares for the ESA Plateau mission. Uh, so today he will talk about Nemesis, the exoplanet transit survey of nearby M dwarfs in TESS, I guess. Uh, so Dex, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katja, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for um, coming today to hear me talk about Nemesis. Uh, uh, so like Katja mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge program. And um, today we're going to talk about this transit survey I conducted of nearby MDORFs in test full-framed images. Uh, so before I begin, I would first like to uh, publicly acknowledge the Nemesis team, which consists of graduate students like myself and Kevin Collins and undergraduate students Samantha Bianco, Mary Jimenez, and Brian Villarreal Alvarado. Uh, we're all under the advisement of Drs. Kayvon Sasson and Peter Plavchan, uh, all of whom, without their efforts and dedication, none of this project would have been possible. Um, so before I begin, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what uh, the test mission is. Uh, so this was the first nearly all-sky space-based transit search mission, which was launched in spring 2018. Uh, and its prime mission test has observed uh, millions of stars since it was launched. It's now uh, in its third year of operation. And what TESS is designed to look for is transit events of planets passing in front of their stars, like in this diagram here, where you observe the brightness over time and you're looking for these eclipses that occur periodically. Um, the prime, one of the primary missions of the TESS mission was to survey over 200,000 stars in order to discover planets that have orbital periods less than 10 days and planet radius less than two and a half Earth radii. Uh, so the way that the, the satellite um, scans the sky is it has four cameras situated on top of each other, and it observes the sky in two hemispheres, one in the south and one in the north. Um, the way it splits up these hemispheres are into 13 sectors, where each sector is observed for 27 days, and it, and it observes these stars in these sectors in two modes of observation, one every, uh, the cadences of every two minutes, and one in cadences of every 30 minutes. Um, so why did I want to focus on MDORFs for a transit survey? Well, there's plenty of them in our galaxy. They're about 70% of our population. And because these stars are typically much smaller than stars like the sun, any uh, planet that happens to transit in front of them will block more of their surface area, meaning they have larger transit depths. Um, and because these stars are smaller, they are of uh, cooler effective temperatures, meaning that if there is a habitable zone around these stars, that's going to be much closer to the star than for stars like the sun or stars like A stars or O stars, as uh, depicted in this diagram. And uh, finally, there aren't a ton of known transiting exoplanets around orbiting M doors. Uh, to date, there's over 3,000 plus transiting exoplanets that have been discovered. Um, but out of the uh, TESS Object of Interest Catalog, or TOI, there's only about 96 of them that are planet candidates, and in the whole exoplanet archive, there's about 99 of them in total. Uh, and when we start to consider the M dwarfs that are nearby, meaning within 100 parsecs, uh, there's even less of them. So there's about 84 in the TOI catalog and 45 in the exoplanet catalog. So I thought it'd be really cool to see if there's even more planet candidates that we could find in test data. But then that brings the question of, OK, how do we get this data? So there are several uh, full frame image pipelines that exist already. Um, but the problem comes down to the target selection uh, that these pipelines focus on. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two modes of observation that TESS operates in. 
Uh, the stars that are pre-selected to be observed every two minutes are typically very bright and isolated, meaning there's no other nearby stars. And the Science Processing and Operating Center team, or SPOC, primarily focuses on these two-minute target lists. But because MDORPs are faint, there's a lot of them that are not observed with two-minute cadences. So that leaves us with 30-minute cadences only. Uh, the QLP team, which stands for Quick Look Pipeline, over at MIT, they primarily focus on all kinds of stars that observe with 30-minute cadences but have test magnitudes less than 13 and a half. Uh, which means there are a lot of faint stars that they're not looking at. Now, both Spock and QOP teams have done amazing jobs since the test mission began with producing uh, test objects of interest. And I thought I saw a niche where I could provide an alternative analysis to study these faint stars in order to add more to the community TOIs and the overall number of MDORF planet candidates. So uh, in order to do a transit survey, first you need a target list. Uh, so my team and I came up with this uh, profile that we thought best describes what an MDORF uh, appears like. So using the test input catalog version eight, we came up with the selection criteria for our effective uh, temperature, our test magnitude, the stellar radius, the mass, the surface gravity. And we wanted to focus on a volume limited sample of stars within hundred parsecs. And to ensure that these are likely MDORFs, we also cross match them with the Cool Dwarf catalog from Moorhead et al. 2018. And when we look at the stellar parameters of our stars distributed in various different ways, like color magnitude diagrams or the stellar radius as a function of mass, we don't find evidence that we have contamination from things like red giants in our sample. So we believe that. For the stars we produced out of this uh, target selection, that they are all likely uh, MDORFs. So, when we look at the distribution of um, MDORF stars observed with 30 minute and two minute cadences for the first five sectors of tests observed, uh, we see that for two minute cadences, about 7,800 of them were observed, but for 30 minute cadences, over 33,000 of these stars were observed. So, there's a lot of stars that are being missed because of this uh, focus on bright stars only. So uh, in terms of spatial distribution, these are how these five sectors are distributed. And within these five sectors, there are about 30 planet candidates, which consist of TOIs, uh, candidates from the Diamante catalog, as well as confirmed uh, known planets that have measured masses. And these are marked in these uh, black points with light blue outlines. Uh, many of these candidates are found near ecliptic longitudes or ecliptic latitudes of minus 90. And this is where the test has a continuous uh, viewing zone, which is observed for almost a year uh, straight. Um, so then this brings us to our actual pipeline. So what does our photometry look like and how is it created? So we produce these things called light curve summary files, which contains the full story of how our photometry is produced. Uh, and this is for uh, this TOI 270 system, which is a multi-planet uh, system. I think it has three transiting planets in it. And the first step is we have to get the full framed image, which is uh, this uh, cutout here on the upper left. Uh, all of these uh, light blue points and red numbers are nearby stars uh, that are cross-referenced with the Gaia catalog. And this blue X is the location of our target star according to the image headers of the full framed images. And this yellow X is the location of our photo center for the aperture that we automatically select. So here, this uh, brown pixels are the apertures that are automatically selected. And this purple uh, colored pixels are the sky background that we use to produce a uh, simple aperture photometry. And this creates these black points on this next row here which is our simple aperture photometry. Uh, these gray points are data points that have bad quality flags as marked by the test mission. So we don't use these um, because they're flagged due to things like the Earth being in the field of view and there being like a lot of glare in between orbits of the satellite. Um, and then to start to apply corrections to the data to improve the photometric precision, we start to use a technique called pixel level decorrelation. And what this does 
is it looks at each image in the full framed images throughout the time series and it grabs different pixels uh, in the image and tries to identify correlations from one image of pixel pairs to the next. So if you have a star that is in the center in one image and then in the next image it's a few pixels up and then it comes back down and it's sort of jittering around. This allows you to find a way to identify those correlations on short time scales uh, throughout the whole time series. So this is uh, marked as this yellow curve here over these black points. And then we use this yellow curve, this noise model from PLD to correct the light curve. And that brings us to this next row where we have a more flattened uh, light curve and black points. And this means we've taken care of short-term variations, but to take care of things like long-term variations that could be due to uh, stellar rotation or star spot modulation or anything else, we use a median-based smoother. And this is marked by this orange line here. And this uh, now produces our next row where we have our PLD corrected and smooth light curve. And we start to perform outlier rejection where we're very careful to uh, keep data points that are consecutive in time so that we're not throwing out uh, real transit events. And these are marked by green points. So again, this is a multi-planet system. So we have many transits of different depths that are being kept by our rejection algorithm. And uh, outliers that are removed are marked by red points, as you can see here. And this brings us to our final uh, PLD corrected smooth and outlier removed uh, light curve that we will use for uh, transit detection. So uh, something that we wanted to think about at this stage was how does the photometry that we produce from the Nemesis pipeline compare to the predicted pre-flight noise model from the Sullivan et al. 2015 paper? So the noise model is shown here in red as this red curve. And this horizontal dashed line is the predicted noise floor for how good test photometry can get, which is 60 parts per million per square root hour. Um, so the photometric precision of our light curves are shown in black. And these uh, green circles are the photometric precision in bins of test magnitude. And as you can see, as we go from simple aperture photometry to PLD corrected light curves, to PLD corrected smooth and outlier removed light curves, our photometry starts to approach uh, the trend that this model predicts closer and closer to where we start to artificially exceed the predicted expectations for really faint stars. So then this allows us to uh, have confidence in the photometry we created, and we can start thinking about uh, transit searching. So uh, in exoplanet uh, transit surveys of the past, one of the more popular methods was the box fitting least squares method, where you fit a box model of a given width and duration and uh, a depth to a periodic transit event, uh, as you can see here. But in 2019, there's a new algorithm called uh, transit least squares, which instead of using a box model, they use an analytical transit model to uh, fit to these periodic events. And the reason why uh, TLS can be more favorable than BLS is that it'll produce a higher signal detection efficiency, or which is related to a uh, signal to noise ratio than uh, BLS can. And here, this is a simulated light curve that I created where I injected transits into them for about a four day period. And you can see both BLS and TLS are picking up on this period but TLS has a higher signal detection efficiency. And that's simply because the analytic transit model can fit a transit event better than a box can. Um, and I can show uh, later on why this is the case, but uh, this is the result that we're seeing so far that TLS is more efficient at detecting transit. So uh, for each transit that we uh, detect, we produce these validation reports. So again, I'm focusing on the TOI-270 system, where we detected the transits of TOI-270C. Um, and here we conduct a number of different tests to uh, visually inspect and vet against uh, false positive scenarios. So uh, in this upper left panel, we have something called the odd even test, where we're looking at odd number transits along with their even number transits. And um, we're looking for things like if these two combinations are 
have different shapes or have different depths or durations. Because if they do, then that means maybe we have something like an eclipsing binary where you have a primary star having a deeper depth than the secondary star does. Or if this odd number of transits are flat and even ones look transit-like, then maybe we have the period wrong. Um, so we also plot the full light curve along with the TLS model transits marked by uh, blue arrows. And here you can see, again, this is a multi-planet system, so there are multiple transits present. And we also plot the TLS power spectrum, which shows the uh, strongest signal in the system along with the harmonics of the system. So this is uh, the half period and twice the period is outside of the transit search range that we use. And we also mark the uh, rate of momentum dumps that are used for this sector. So every so often the test satellite will fire its thrusters in order to maintain pointing. And one of the reasons we had to utilize pixel level decorrelation was to uh, correct for these effects where you have like your star centered and then there's a shift in the images. So we were careful to also pay attention to where these momentum dump rates are uh, for each sector as to not uh, incorrectly identify a momentum dump event as a transit event. Uh, we also look at the full framed images with nearby stars marked by the Gaia catalog. And we also compare them to cutouts from the digital sky survey, which has a lower uh, pixel scale resolution. So for tests, the pixel scale is about 21 arc seconds per pixel. For the digital sky survey, I think it's about three or four uh, pixels uh, per arc second. So here it's easier to visually identify where the nearby stars are that are in the test full framed images. And we also track the location of our photo centers, our centroids, these yellow X's, uh, throughout the time series, particularly during the time of transit. So here on this uh, lower left panel, we have our vertical axes showing the horizontal and vertical positions of the centroid during the time of transit in units of pixels. And these are basically at zero, meaning that our centroids are staying still and this is a good sign. If we had a lot of motion during the time of transit, then that would indicate that something went wrong with our photometry and this is probably a false positive. Uh, and another way that we look at our transit events is we fold our events over themselves in a couple of different ways. Uh, so first we fold our light curve over the uh, detected period by TLS and we center the event at a phase of zero, meaning that um, at phase zero, we have the, the transit mid-center time. So if this is a real event, it should always be folded at zero. And this gives you a way to visually identify how long the transit is. We also do the same thing at half and twice the period. Uh, this is another way to check for eclipsing binaries, because if um, it was an eclipsing binary, then you would see uh, different shapes occur at this phase of zero. And we also look at the full phase of the light curve going from zero to one, where we shift the phase by a quarter cycle so that transits will always occur at phase uh, 0.25. And if there are any secondary or tertiary events, they will occur at phase 0.75 or 0.5. And the last thing we do with these validation reports is we also have an alternative automated vetting procedure which uses the EDI Vetter Unplug tool created by Dr. John Zink. And this does a number of different tests, which checks for flux contamination, whether there's too many transits that are masked, uh, odd even transit variations, if there are any other uh, signals present in the light curve. And this is marked as red in this example because this is a multi planet system. So there are other signals uh, in phase, which are more apparent here. Um, it also checks for secondary eclipses, if there's low phase coverage, or if the transit duration is too long for the signal that's detected. And if any of these are flagged as being true, uh, they get marked as a false positive. Uh, not that this, this system is a false positive, but that it requires a second look. And because we already know that this is a multi plan system, in this case, it's okay. Uh, so. Uh, we also do a few rounds of group vetting. So like I just mentioned, we use the automated 
uh, EDI Veteran Unplugged tool. Um, we do a visual inspection of these TLS validation reports and the light curve summary files, as I've shown before. And then we vote on these candidates in categories of planet candidates, eclipsing binaries, uh, stellar variation, and other, in case uh, something weird happened and we don't know what to call it. Um, so for the planet candidate votes, we then reanalyze these systems with optimized uh, pipeline settings for that system. And then we also explore at harmonics of the detected period as well as doing a loam scargo analysis of the different versions of our light curves. And if all of these uh, tests and checks and follow-up analysis uh, still seem like planet candidates, we then perform an MCMC analysis to constrain the orbital parameters. And we do MCMC using the Python package uh, Exoplanet created by Dan Foreman Mackey in 2018 or 2010. And uh, basically the, we fit a transit model using uh, four uh, priors, um, which are the orbital period, the transit time, the planet to star radius ratio and the impact parameter. So this is the uh, MCMC uh, median transit model that we came up with for TOI 270C. And this is the posterior distribution that we obtained for all of our transit uh, fits. And for all the parameters that we obtained for the system, these are all within the published values uh, for the system by Jennifer Winters at all. Uh, so this was a really good sanity check to make sure that not only is Nemesis producing acceptable uh, transit depths, but we're able to recover publishable values. So this gives us some sense of confidence that the candidates we do find are being measured accurately. So uh, another thing we want to think about is, okay, so we have photometry, we have a way of measuring uh, orbital parameters and constraining them. How well can the Nemesis pipeline actually produce transit detections in general? Uh, so to do this, we first needed a sample of stars that best represented our data set. So we looked at the photometric precision as a function of magnitude for the five sectors that we observed. And we looked at the light curves that had photometric precisions closest to 0 0.025, 0 0.5, and 0.975 quantiles in bins of test magnitude. Uh, this gives us a sense of the best average and worst quality data for each sector. And for each sector, we chose a total of 30 stars for a total of 150 representative stars. And for each one, we used a randomly sampled uniform distribution of orbital periods ranging from half to nine days and planet radii ranging from half to 11 days. And this allowed us to inject uh, different types of uh, transit models of different uh, periods and different depths and durations. And for uh, the total number of uh, simulated models that we injected, we injected 21,600 of them using the Batman Python package. And we decided to inject them right after we extracted the aperture photometry because we wanted to see how uh, pixel level decorrelation and smoothing would affect the shapes of these transits and our ability to detect them. So after we do a simple aperture photometry, we inject the transits and then perform the rest of the pipeline as normal. And in order to uh, validate our ability to recover these injections, we had two criteria where one, we wanted to consider that the recovered, pipe, the recovered period is within 1% of the injected period. And two, that the injected radius is within the measured errors of the TLS model planet radius. So in total, when we consider those two criteria, uh, when we use BLS versus when we use TLS, TLS seems to perform much better in being sensitive to these different kinds of transits than BLS does. Uh, so on this plot here, we have um, our injected planet radius on the y-axis and our injected orbital period on the x-axis. And the color scale is the sensitivity fraction or the recovery rate of um, 
our recovered transits. So if it has a value of one, that means we recovered every single one. If it has a value of zero, it means we recovered absolutely none of them. Uh, so for large short period planets, we're able to recover about half of them uh, for most of the parameter space that we explored using TLS, but for BLS, it's closer to 30 to 40 percent. Um, where for really large planets in the two to five day range for TLS, we're recovering 70 to 90 percent almost. So this is why even though TLS is more computationally expensive to produce, it's worthwhile to use instead of uh, BLS. So now that we have our 2D map of uh, sensitivity for transit detections, we need to account for detectable but not transiting planets. So in order to do so, we calculate the geometric transit probability using this equation, uh, where we do so for each orbital period and planet radius in our 2D map. Uh, so we have a 2D map of uh, geometric transit probability, and we multiply that by our detection sensitivity 2D map. And this yields us a 2D map of survey completeness. And because uh, TLS performed better in terms of detection sensitivity, also has a better map of 2D uh, survey completeness. So for a short period, uh, large transits, we're able to have a survey completeness ranging from about three to almost 7% using TLS. But using BLS, uniformly, it ranges from about 2 to 3%. So again, uh, TLS is a more favorable technique uh, when using our photometry. So uh, that was a lot of talk about what Nemesis is, what it does, what did, what did we actually find, right? <laughs> That's why we're all here. Uh, so here's a gallery of all of the transit planet candidates that we produced for the first five sectors of test. So the ones that have green borders are already flagged in the TOI catalog. So we were able to recover TOIs 269, 270, 393, 455, and 1201. Uh, so in total, we found five TOIs and 24 new planet candidates that were not previously detected anywhere else. So that's really exciting. Um, so how do these uh, planet candidates compare with others in terms of planet demographics? So um, here there's a lot of information on this panel, so I just wanted to take a moment to just uh, talk about each uh, visual here. So first, uh, these orange lines that you see here, these are the bounds of our transit survey. We decided to focus on a range of one to nine days because um, uh, we're doing single sector transit searches instead of a multi-sector approach. So since each sector is observed for 27 days at a time, we wanted to allow for at least three transit events to be detected, meaning that uh, nine days is the maximum orbital period that we could search to allow for three transits in each sector. And we chose a minimum range of one day because some MDORFs can have really short period uh, rotational periods. And that can be really difficult to distangle those rotational periods from, uh, say, like a transiting planet. So we decided to make a lower limit at one day. Uh, so on this graph, there's also these uh, contours. These are the kernel density estimates for every single M-dwarf planet in the exoplanet archive, which are about 100 of them. And they're all typically uh, focused around one Earth radii, meaning that most uh, M dwarfs that were found are basically rocky planets that are close to their star. Um, with these uh, horizontal lines, these show uh, slopes that uh, indicate the relationship between planet radius and orbital period for the radius valley of different types of star systems. Uh, so the radius valley is something that has become a more popular term over the last decade of exoplanet science, where if you look at the distributions of planet radius, uh, there seems to be a really large gap in between one and three Earth, where the planet radius is, or the, the planet radius valley is. So uh, these slopes indicate where these radius valleys are for sun like stars. Uh, as this horizontal line shows, uh, FGK stars, where there's red line is, and uh, low mass stars, which are the ones that we're surveying in this project. So when we look at the low mass star slope, 
we can see that there are quite a few um, of our candidates, which are marked by circles, that are very close to this line, with one candidate being exactly on this line. Uh, so this makes an interesting subsample of um, stars to study because this uh, can inform us on how these uh, M dwarf systems can uh, form these planets of different orbits. And uh, the, trying to study what the radius validity is for M dwarf systems is, is an area of study that's uh, pretty new these days. So it's pretty interesting to start thinking about these sort of things. Um, and lastly, uh, all of these uh, colors are scaled to our calculated stellar insulations and in units of uh, Earth insulation. So it has a value of one, and that means that this planet is receiving the same exact radiation as the Earth does. Um, on this scale, because there's such a wide range of stellar insulation, it's hard to tell which ones are uh, Earth-like, but the lowest value for these planet candidates is about three and a half. So none of these are exactly habitable, unfortunately, but they are uh, pretty warm. Um, and lastly, when we consider the uh, number of planet candidates and confirmed planet candidates, in total, they add up to about 30, but with the Nemesis pipeline, we found about 24 new detections. So there's a lot of planets that are being missed because these are really faint stars. And I think uh, it's really exciting to see what Nemesis can do uh, when we look, start to look at the other test sectors that TESS has observed since its inception. So uh, another thing we want to consider is, OK, so we have all these planet candidates. They're vetted. We think they're real, uh, but they're not confirmed. So how do we go about uh, confirming these candidates? So we wanted to see how well these candidates are suited for follow-up characterization. And in order to do that, we needed to infer something about their planet mass to start thinking about Doppler spectroscopy. So to do that, we used the planet mass radiation uh, relation from Chen and Kipping 2016 to infer our planet masses. So here's on this upper left panel is our planet radius as a function of inferred planet mass, where they're colored by the J magnitude of our targets. And as you can see, many of our targets are pretty faint in J magnitude. Um, and with those inferred masses, we're able to calculate the expected uh, Doppler shift or radial velocity in meters per second, uh, which brings us to this upper right panel where we have our inferred masses, now the color scale and our J magnitude on the x-axis. And many of our candidates have expected radial velocities of more than a few meters per second. And current facilities that do Doppler spectroscopy, they can maintain precision of about a meter per second. So they should be able to observe uh, quite a few of these candidates. And uh, lastly, when considering the uh, James Webb Space Telescope's uh, launch that's coming up soon, uh, there are two metrics that are starting to be used more commonly called the transmission spectroscopy metric and the emission spectroscopy metric. So TSM is proportional to the expected transmission spectroscopy signal to noise ratio for WSC. And ESM is proportional to the expected signal to noise ratios uh, secondary eclipse detection at mid infrared wavelength. So this kind of gives a measure of how uh, suitable uh, planets can be for characterization by James, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so here on these bottom left and right panels, we have our candidates uh, displayed in units of signal to noise ratio as a function of transit transmission spectroscopy metric and emission spectroscopy metric. And with the exception of one of our candidates, all of our candidates have signal to noise ratios greater than seven and a half. And they all have pretty high emission spectroscopy metrics. So we feel that these are all really good candidates to do follow-up characterization in the future. Um, so to summarize, uh, we surveyed over 33,000 uh, M dwarfs that are within 100 parsecs in test sectors one to five. Of those 33,000, 183 of them were threshold crossing events, meaning they were flagged as being uh, transit detection. And of those 183, after group vetting and numerous process of reanalysis, 29 of them were vetted as planet candidates. Additionally, when we look at our 2D survey completeness maps, 
of our planet candidates combined with other planet candidates and known planets, we found that we get an integrated occurrence rate of about two and a half planets per M dwarf star in bins of orbital periods from one to nine days and half to 11 Earth radii. So that means for any given M dwarf star, at short periods, there should be two and a half planets in that system, which is really exciting to think about, meaning that there should be more multi-planet systems that are discovered and something we're gonna look out for in the future. And additionally, um, when looking at the prime mission as a whole from sectors one to 26, based on the 29 that we found, we project a total yield of 122 transit detections for nearby M dwarfs. So some of the numbers I, I spoke about earlier in the TOI catalog, there's about 84 uh, nearby uh, M dwarf planet candidates, and there are only 45 that are known. So we would almost more than double this amount uh, with the projected yield that we expect to produce. And uh, lastly, um, all of our light curves, our follow-up analysis and validation files are all publicly available at filtergraph.com slash nemesis. And I thank you all for uh, listening to the science that my team and I have done. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. And I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dex. Um, do we have any questions already? Yes, yeah, so, oh, so my is clapping, but I don't think that's a question. Um, I, I do have one question though, um, to start with. Um, so what's maybe the, what you consider the most exotic system that you found with Nemesis? Um, let's see, I'm having a hard time uh, remembering off the top of my head. Uh, but the one that I thought was was most interesting, I, I'm struggling to remember the exact parameters for it, was uh, this particular candidate, which lied on the radius valley exactly. Because uh, I think something that uh, is starting to happen um, as more people are analyzing test data is that we're starting to see more planets in the radius valley than that was previously observed with past surveys like Kepler or um, or Spitzer, for example. So a lot of people are starting to find many Neptunes that are orbiting M dwarf planets that uh, were previously um, undetected. So it's interesting to see um, how more planets are starting to fill this radius valley. And we already have like about three that are really close to it. So uh, as we do more uh, test observations of other sectors, it'd be cool to see if we can find even more that are in this range. Okay, um, so I see there's a question from Samaya, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was a great talk. Um, you might have mentioned this or maybe I missed it. Uh, I was wondering how you implemented, implemented the TLS uh, algorithm. Did you use a software package for that? Yeah, uh, so um, Michael Hipke and Renee Heller produced a Python package that can do this for you. Um, it's really uh, easy to use. You basically uh, feed in a light curve, uh, you know, like time, flux, and error into the, the algorithm. And you can also select things like stellar parameters, limb darkening parameters, if you happen to know more about the star. Um, for us, we just use the, uh, the stellar parameters from the test input catalog. But it is very easy to use, and um, I believe they have a GitHub that has a few tutorials on how to use it as well. Great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I'm just, um, so there was this um, impact parameter that you mentioned as a prior, I think, to fitting. I'm not um, sure what that is, if you could just maybe explain. Yeah, so the um, impact parameter is sort of uh, how the uh, planet transits in front of the star. So if it has an impact parameter of zero, that means it's like exactly transiting across the face of the star. If it has a high impact parameter, that means it's probably grazing across the edge of the star. Uh, so for us, um, since we assumed almost nothing about these uh, systems in a blind, blind transit survey, we uh, used a prior ranging from zero to one 
for the impact parameters and just let MCMC sort of constrain what it thought was the best solution for how this uh, planet is transiting in front of the star. Okay, thank you. And, and do you think uh, something similar could be used uh, with the Rubin data? So the LSST data? Yeah, I mean, uh, the way that uh, Nemesis functions, or at least the transit uh, searching aspect functions, uh, it can work with any kind of photometry. So it can be ground-based data, it can be space-based data, as long as um, there's a periodic event that's detectable, uh, we can do this sort of searching and modeling uh, with it. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions left here from the audience? I don't see any other hands up, so if there are no more questions, I would like to thank our speaker, Dex, again for the very interesting talk, and let's wrap it up here. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye.